Module 4, Politics of Russia, China, Japan and Mexico. The Politics of Japan, Constitutional Shifts and Economic Dynamics. In the intricate world of Japanese politics, the debate around constitutional amendments, specifically regarding Article 9, epitomizes the nation's struggle with its post-war identity. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's audacious proposal to transform the Japan Self-Defense Forces into a national army challenges the pacifist essence of the post-WWII peace constitution. This initiative, reflecting a shift towards a more assertive military posture, has sparked heated discussions, both domestically and internationally, about Japan's role in global affairs and its commitment to peace. The controversy intensified with Deputy PM Taro Aso's ill-advised reference to Nazi Germany's constitutional changes, a comment that he later retracted amidst widespread criticism. This incident underscored the delicacy of Japan's militaristic history and the ongoing sensitivity around its constitutional revisions. Such political moves reflect a broader trend of Japan grappling with nationalistic sentiments and its historical legacy, as it seeks to redefine its place in the modern world. Interwoven with these constitutional debates is Japan's post-WWII economic narrative. The nation's embrace of protectionist policies was a critical response to its devastated post-war economy. By sheltering its nascent industries from international competition, Japan laid the foundation for a prolonged economic boom. This strategy, pivotal in the area of international trade and protectionist policies, showcases Japan's adeptness in transforming economic challenges into opportunities for growth and prosperity. Russian politics, Putin's influence. In the grand tapestry of Russian politics, Vladimir Putin's ascent from a KGB officer to the pinnacle of power provides a compelling narrative. His journey began at the formidable KGB, where he served for 15 years, gaining skills that would later prove invaluable in navigating the complex corridors of Russian power. Post-KGB, Putin's career took an academic turn at Leningrad State University before shifting to political advisement in St. Petersburg, and eventually leading him to Moscow's higher echelons of power under President Boris Yeltsin. In the twilight of 1999, as the world prepared to welcome a new millennium, Yeltsin's surprise resignation catapulted Putin into the presidency, a role he assumed first as acting president and then, following a decisive election victory, as the elected leader. His tenure was marked by efforts to combat corruption and restructure the economy, alongside a strong emphasis on reasserting central control over Russia's vast regions and republics. Understanding the division of power in Russia requires a closer look at the roles of the president and the prime minister. The president, as the head of state, is more than just a figurehead, they are the guarantor of the constitution and the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, encompassing control over nuclear weapons, foreign policy, and key governmental departments. This role involves appointing and potentially dismissing the prime minister with parliamentary approval. The Prime Minister, while seemingly in the President's shadow, manages a vast array of responsibilities, primarily steering the country's economic ship. They head the Cabinet of Ministers and are responsible for implementing domestic and foreign policies, economic and fiscal management and controlling prices of critical resources like gas and electricity. The Prime Minister also oversees various civil sectors, including education and health, China, politics and transition. Welcome to an intriguing journey through the political landscape of China, a country where the past and present blend like colors in an artist's palette. Let's start with the elephant in the room, the one-child policy. This policy wasn't just a rule, it was a societal game-changer. Implemented in 1979, it was China's drastic measure to control its burgeoning population. But this policy was more than just a demographic tool it was a reflection of China's unique approach to governance, authoritative, direct, and often, controversial. Imagine living in a society where the number of children you could have wasn't just a personal choice but a state-mandated decree. China's brutal one-child policy wasn't just a headline, it was a reality for millions. Families were restricted, and the policy reshaped the social fabric. It had profound effects, some intended, like slowing population growth, and others unintended, like an aging population and gender imbalances. Now, fast forward to a significant moment in China's political history, the introduction of the one country, two systems principle. This was China's innovative yet pragmatic approach to deal with a special puzzle piece, Hong Kong. This policy, crafted in the context of Hong Kong's 1997 handover from British to Chinese rule, was like a political symphony with a delicate balance of autonomy and central control. It wasn't about Taiwan, immigrants, the USA, or the Soviet Union's fall, 
it was all about making Hong Kong's transition as smooth as a silk scroll. But wait, there's more. How is the political life of ordinary Chinese different today compared to the Maoist era? Well, it's like comparing a black and white TV to a 4K ultra high definition screen. Under Mao, China was under the grips of revolutionary zeal, a period marked by upheavals like the Cultural Revolution, where political life was often a blend of ideology and survival. Today, while the Communist Party still holds the reins, the focus has shifted. Economic development, technological innovation, and a more connected global presence define today's China. Gone are the days of the iron rice bowl and revolutionary slogans. Now, you'll find a China bustling with e-commerce, skyscrapers, and an emerging middle class. Yes, there are still restrictions, let's not forget the Great Firewall of China, but the average Chinese citizen today experiences a blend of tradition and modernity, surveillance and opportunity, unlike anything seen in the Maoist era. Politics in Mexico, a journey through modern economic policy. Welcome to a riveting journey through the economic and political landscape of modern Mexico. Fasten your seatbelts, because we're about to dive into a world where neoliberalism meets public expectations, and where presidents juggle with reforms like skilled circus performers. Let's start with the economic model adopted under Mexico's for most recent presidents. Contrary to the allure of extreme systems like Marxism or laissez-faire capitalism, Mexico has chosen a path of neoliberal economic development. Think of it as a carefully choreographed dance between government intervention and market freedom. This model emphasizes privatization, deregulation, and reducing the state's role in the economy, all while keeping a watchful eye on macroeconomic stability. This delicate balance aims to create a fertile ground for growth without letting the reins go entirely. Now, let's peek into the collective Mexican psyche regarding the government's role in the economy. In Mexico, there's a prevailing belief that the government isn't just a bystander but a key player in economic matters. The Mexican populace generally expects the government to have a hand in steering the economic ship, ensuring it doesn't veer off course. This isn't about micromanaging every aspect of the economy, but rather about being a responsible captain who keeps an eye on the horizon and adjusts the sails as needed. Amidst this backdrop, one particular president made waves with his reform agenda. Just three months into his presidency, Enrique Pina Nieto, from the Institutional Revolutionary Party, PRI, was already rewriting his reform playbook. His tenure was marked by an ambitious drive to overhaul Mexico's state-owned energy sector, a move as bold as it was contentious. This sector, helmed by Petróleos Mexicanos, is no small fry, it's a titan in the Mexican economy, managing the country's substantial oil reserves. Pina Nieto eyed the Brazilian model, where private investment transformed the energy landscape. He envisioned a similar metamorphosis for Pemex, proposing alliances with the private sector to inject vigor and innovation into the aging giant. However, reforming something as pivotal as the energy sector in Mexico is akin to a tightrope walk over a political chasm. It required a delicate balance of political maneuvering and negotiation, especially with the PRI lacking a clear majority in Congress. Interestingly, the Pemex Union, often a thorn in the side of reformists, was aligned with the PRI, offering a unique opportunity to push through changes that could have been mired in endless debates and opposition. The need for reform was underlined by a stark reality, Mexico's oil output was dwindling, and without a significant overhaul, the country risked becoming a net oil importer, a scenario that would have far-reaching economic consequences. The 2008 energy reform, though moderate, set the stage for these ambitious changes, showing that even the most sacred cows in Mexican politics could be re-evaluated and reshaped. Pina Nieto's optimism and willingness to place energy reform at the top of his agenda indicated a president ready to navigate the complex political and economic terrains to achieve significant change.